Uh, welcome to the 15th meeting of 2017 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. We have apologies from David Stewart. Uh, we meet this morning in the aftermath of the horrific attack in Manchester yesterday evening. Uh, our thoughts are with the families and loved ones of all of those affected by this senseless act, as well as the emergency services uh, who we are so grateful to for the work they did in dealing with the aftermath of the atrocity. Uh, as has been said before in this Parliament, whatever our disagreements in this place or any other, we stand united in our core values of democracy, human rights and the rule of law. And those values are strong and they will endure. I know I speak for all of my colleagues here when I say that we stand shoulder to shoulder with the people of Manchester today. Uh, as a mark of respect, the Parliament's flags are flying at half-mast. Before we move to the first item on the agenda, I would like to remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones as they may affect the broadcasting system. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take item four in private. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The second item of business on our agenda today is to hear from the Wild Animals in Travelling Circuses Scotland Bill team from the Scottish Government. We are joined by officials who have been working on the bill. I welcome Andrew Voss, the Veterinary Advisor, Angela Lawson, Solicitor. Good morning, you're very welcome. Members of a series of questions for you. Um, I'll kick those off. I wonder if you could um, start uh, uh, registering an interest in this. You can register now or when you come to ask a question. Yeah, I'll, I'll do it just now. I can uh, refer members to my register of interest. I am the convener and honorary member of the Showman's Guild in Scotland. Okay, that's duly noted, Mr Lyle. Thank you. Uh, moving to questions, uh, can I ask the witnesses whether the three-year gap between the consultation and the Bill's introduction poses any challenges for the Scottish Government in ensuring that the Bill reflects the latest scientific evidence and public views relating to the issue? Yes, well, the basis for the Bill is basically on some key ethical arguments. So we are aware there have been developments in scientific evidence, and these were outlined in the Dorney Harris report for the Welsh Government. Um, but really, the ethical arguments, I think, remain unchanged. Some of the scientific evidence might have strengthened concern for uh, some aspects of keeping animals in travelling circuses, but really the key ethical arguments remain unchanged from the ones that we laid out in the consultation in 2014. Yes, but the, the, the Welsh Government has plans for a scheme aimed at addressing mobile animal exhibits more widely, and the Scottish Government has acknowledged that the current legislative framework in this area, which dates back to 1925 in part, is somewhat dated and might benefit from review. Did the Government consider undertaking a kind of follow-up consultation that would have sought a wider range of views and filled that gap between 2014 and now? Um, well, regarding the other uses of animals, um, we, we obviously are aware, and especially when drafting the bill, we were very aware that there were a wide variety of other uses of wild and domestic animals for performance or public display, ranging from zoos and safari parks, which have a statutory obligation to be involved in conservation and education, and I think are generally accepted by most of the public as being acceptable. Um, in the middle, there are a whole range of um, uses of wild animals, such as birds of prey that you might see at country fairs, or animals being taken into schools so children can hold snakes or you know, you know, see what different animals look like. Um, and a whole variety of other uses of animals. But we are aware that the public don't seem to have the same fundamental ethical objection to these other uses of animals as they do with circuses. So I think the argument is that circuses are, create a you know, sufficient moral opprobrium that the only appropriate way of dealing with them and with the particular ethical arguments that apply inevitably to circuses is complete prohibition of circuses. Whereas these other uses, it would be appropriate to introduce um, or tighten up the registration and licensing requirements to modernize the uh, approach from the 1925 Act. And the assertion you've just made there about the public view is presumably informed by the volume and nature of the correspondence that was received in relation to the um, call for views. Uh, but that's not been published in detail yet, has it? So I wonder if you could give us a flavour of 
the volume of views that you received uh, and also the, the sort of nature of them and what was the balance? Um, well, the consultation analysis has been published and the individual consultation responses, I believe, have been published very recently. Okay. And the consultation was back in 2014. Um, so the consultation analysis extracted some of the key points that were made by the respondents. Um, I mean, as well as that, we are aware from public opinion polls um, dating back over the last 10 years, uh, UK public opinion polls, that maybe between 70 and 80 percent of the public, when a random sample of the public is asked, they will support a ban on wild animals in travelling circuses. And the most recent one was a YouGov poll from 2013, I think it was, where they actually broke it down by different species. And although there was more support for banning sort of bears, big cats and elephants, there was still significant support for banning mm. things like parrots and, uh, and snakes. And we also have had a you know, constant stream of correspondence, as regular correspondence, to ministers that we answer. Um, some of this was sparked off by things like the visit of the big cats to Peterhead back in 2014, which is actually after the consultation, but we know there were a lot of letters at that time basically asking why we hadn't yet banned wild animals in travelling circuses in Scotland. Okay. Um, th this committee has taken a particular interest in engaging with young people to gauge mm. their views. I'm just wondering, was there any particular effort made in the consultation to, to get the opinions of young people and what form that took? Right, well, the consultation, uh, obviously it was open to everyone to respond. We aren't aware that there were any particular responses from young people and we haven't yet made any particular initiative to engage young people. It is something we still have the option of doing as the bill progresses, so that is something that we would look into. But we know from the responses that were submitted, a significant concern was the potentially damaging effect on young people from seeing wild animals used in travelling circuses. And the particular way that animals are used in travelling circuses, where they are made to perform unnatural behaviours or they're dressed up in clothing um, mm -hmm. that's not natural, human clothing, or they might do things you know, that invite people to laugh at them or make fun of them. So the animals are... The argument is that animals are seen as props for entertainment or as ways of demonstrating the superiority of the trainer in being able to train them or you know, the cleverness of the trainers in being able to make them do certain acts. So several respondents made the point that that sort of thing was actually harmful for young people to see because it gives them a false impression of wild animals and shows a lack of respect for the inherent nature of wild animals to see them used in that sort of way. But we haven't actually asked young people... We haven't specifically asked young people, okay, no. We just need to get that on the record. Mark Roscoe. Yeah. Just in terms of the other uses of wild animals uh, in terms of performance, uh, have you done any attitudinal surveys on this or polling just to see what the attitude is to say you know wild raptors being used in a in a display or um we haven't on these other uses of animals we haven't done any specific work on that we are aware you know from time to time people do write in with concerns about these other uses of animals and obviously we have representations and we often have discussions with groups such as One Kind and the Scottish SPCA who do raise concerns about some of these other uses. Um, and this really gives us the basis for the further work that we intend to go on to, which was announced by the Cabinet Secretary recently, that we will be modernising the Performing Animals Act 1925. So this is work that we are now planning to go on to do. But how do you know that, there's a, how do you know that, that there is a difference in public attitude in relation to circuses compared to the other uses, because you're saying there's quite a, quite a big ethical difference in the public's mm -hmm. mind between circuses and other uses. I'm just trying to work out what the evidence basis is for that. Because the consultation mm -hmm. for this bill was about this bill. Yes, it was wasn't specifically... It? It wasn't about other uh, uses. Yeah, the, the consultation was specifically about the use of wild animals in travelling circuses. Um, some people did make remarks about other uses of animals, but yeah, there weren't large numbers of those responses. But what's your basis for the ethical distinction between circuses and other uses of animals in performance? Uh, 
Okay. Well, that was outlined in the consultation. So there are some key ethical arguments that apply inevitably to the use of wild animals in travelling circuses. Some of these apply to a certain extent to the various other uses of animals, but they don't all apply in the same way. So the, f the first um, ethical argument is the lack of respect shown for animals, as I've outlined, that animals are wild animals um, um, are perceived as having a particular status and they should be able to fulfil their natural potential as wild animals. And so to use them in a way that's seen as demeaning or a, a source of amusement um, is contrary to their natural essence, if you like, and so that's an inherently disrespectful attitude, which, as I've said, can foster harmful attitudes in young people who are exposed to that. That was the first part of the argument. Um, the second part of the argument is that the travelling circus environment in particular involves keeping animals in relatively barren enclosures, um, subject to the stress of transport and disturbance. And in those situations, it's inherently difficult to allow a wild animal to express its full range of natural behaviours and to provide suitable accommodation that allows it to do that. So although animals may not actually be physically suffering um, if they're transported as part of a travelling circus, it's, not, it's inherently difficult in those situations for them to fulfil their instincts and wild behaviour, to be able to breed, to be able to shelter, to be able to you know, move about in the way that they would like to as wild animals. So that's the second part of it. And the third key argument is that although for other uses of animals, either domestic or wild animals, we accept that there can be some compromise to their ideal welfare, but that is justified by, for example, farm animals. We accept that they're not always kept in optimal ideal conditions, but um, there is the wider benefit to humans of being able to have food at a reasonable price or use animals for um, leather or milk production. With other types of wild animal keeping or performance, there may be values um, in terms of conservation. Um, so zoos take part in planned breeding programs. There may be educational value in taking wild animals into schools so children can see them. So there are these other you know, wide um, benefits that justify some of the ethical costs or potential welfare compromises. And the argument is with circuses, these are um, basically commercial money-making operations and it's purely providing a particular type of entertainment, um, it's a particular type of entertainment that is widely perceived as outdated. Um, so that's really the lack of a justifying benefit in circuses that doesn't seem to apply in the public mind to all these other possible uses of wild animals. Yeah. Okay, I mean, I, I get the, the ethical basis for the bill. Mm -hmm. I'm still trying to understand whether the public view on circuses also translates to other forms of animal performance, but it's clear that you don't have that, that data, but I understand better now the ethical basis mm -hmm. of the bill. Let's kind of explore the ethical issue, uh, Emma Harper. Good morning. Um, in the policy memorandum, it talks about the, you know, the, I guess, the ethical versus welfare issues, and it's kind of hard to separate them because of because ethics and welfare is, I guess, part and parcel. So, how did you distinguish the welfare concerns from the ethical concerns relating to wild animals in travelling circuses? Um. <clears throat> And as I sort of outlined, some of the, the ethical concerns are clearly related to the welfare aspects of whether it's actually possible to keep animals in circuses you know, without compromising their welfare. So that, that is part of the ethical concern. But the, in a way, we, the scientific evidence that we have, and that was the conclusion of the Radford report in 2007, is that it's hard to find objective scientific evidence that would apply to all wild animal species that might be used in travelling circuses. So there probably is quite good evidence on um, animals such as elephants and possibly big cats, which might 
suggests that their welfare is sufficiently compromised in circuses to justify a complete ban. But that to gather that sort of evidence in sufficient detail for every single species that might be used in a travelling circus is very difficult scientifically. And I think the, there is this wider ethical objection that no matter whether a wild animal can be shown to be actually suffering or maybe not in ideal welfare conditions, the, the key eth ethical objection is that wild animals just shouldn't be used in that sort of environment purely for entertainment, made to perform unnatural acts and being you know, dressed up in you know, unnatural regalia or, or clothing. So there is this wider ethical objection that applies to all wild animals. So it's not just mm -hmm. specific welfare concerns about specific species. I mean, I think it is fair enough to look at the ethics as opposed to welfare because we're probably talking about snakes all the way to seals and zebras and like a, a real wide variety of wild animals, elephants and big cats included. Yes, exactly. So. Yeah. Kate Forbes. Thank you very much. I wondered if you could, if the Scottish, um, if you could elaborate on the three ethical issues, the impact on respect for animals, the impact of travelling environments on an animal's nature, and the ethical costs versus benefits. Um, well, as I have outlined those areas already, so the matter of respect for animals, as I say, it's um, the view that was expressed was that wild animals should be free to express their natural essence and natural mm. wildness, or telos, if you like, is the sort of technical term. And putting animals in unnatural environments, making them do unnatural tricks, unnatural behaviours, or being dressed up in unnatural ways is sort of demeaning or humiliating for them. Um, that's the perception that was expressed to us. So those are some of the remarks mm. that were made in response to the consultation that people felt that it was portraying animals that should be considered as you know, wild, free animals expressing mm. their natural behaviour are being you know, brought into a very unnatural situation, made to do unnatural things. Mm. And that is sort of contrary to their, their natural mm. purpose in life, if you like. What about that uh, third one, the ethical costs versus benefits? Yes, well, um, as I said, we accept in a variety of situations that there can be a, a welfare cost to animals, but that is can then be justified by some benefit to animals or wider society in general. So we accept a welfare compromise to farm animals, which might not always mm. be kept in ideal conditions, but they are fulfilling a, a purpose um, by providing uh, food and, and drink. And similarly with zoo animals, people do have concerns about conditions that wild animals are kept in, in zoos but um, zoos fulfil a valuable conservation and education role. They take part in planned breeding programmes which are coordinated you know, worldwide, and they also do useful work in education. In fact, zoos and safari parks have a statutory obligation to be involved in such work, and they do that. So there's a, a welfare cost to those animals in being kept confined, although they can be kept in more natural environments than in a travelling circus, but the people would still agree there is a potential welfare cost to those animals. But that is then justified by the benefit of conservation and education and a wider benefit to society. Whereas if you consider the travelling circus environment, the welfare cost or the, the ethical objections to the use of animals in the travelling circus environment can't be justified purely by the commercial benefit to the circus owners in providing you know, a spectacle purely for public entertainment. Mm. A lot of it, it strikes me is, is that balance between um, being evidence-based uh, justification mm -hmm. for uh, this sort of legislation, but also very much taking into account what general public opinion is mm -hmm. and presumably trying to find a middle ground where, where both of these things meet. Um, yes, I mean, it, the approach in the consultation is quite unusual because we tend to um, try to base legislation on objective evidence or scientific evidence if that's available. So the approach here has been to gather or try to gather evidence of the ethical objections of the general public. And that was the purpose of the consultation in 2014, 
was to seek views and opinions on the ethical arguments that had been su suggested. And, and so as a result of that consultation, we had over 2,000 responses mm. and you know, clearly 95% or more of those responses agree that animals, wild animals in travelling circuses should be banned. Mm. But there were some quite detailed responses to the specific ethical questions were asked. So um, we certainly didn't treat the consultation as an opinion poll or a mini referendum. We were really interested in trying to look at the detailed arguments that were put forward by some of the respondents. Uh, and they are outlined in the response to the consultation. Okay, thanks. Let's get into the nitty gritty of the bill. Uh, Richard Lyle. Thank you, convener. Um, I said earlier I'm the convener of the cross party group for the Showman's Guild. Who did you consult uh, in the industry in regard to this proposal? Um, well, the consultation was open to, to all, and we did have some responses from the circus industry. Um, so there was the Circus Guild for Great Britain. I think it yeah. is. And the, yeah, but not the Showman's Guild. I don't think we... Well, it was an open public consultation which was advertised. I don't think we had a response from the Showman's Guild. Right. I, as a child, I, I remember going to circuses most of us can remember. Um, mm -hmm. But this legislation does not define what a circus is. So why doesn't the legislation define a circus? Or what is... A, to your mind, what is a circus? Um, well... Our view was that there's a common understanding of what a, a circus is and that it would take its dictionary definition, but I'll pass this on to Angela, who's the legal it's, advisor. We were, um, we were very... Um, or the Scottish Government's view was that there is an ordinary meaning of circus, and I'm sure people around the room have an interpretation and a view of what a circus is. We didn't want to be unduly restrictive in defining what a circus is and follow, for example, the previous legislation, which is over 35 years old in the Dangerous Wild Animals Act or Zoo Licensing Act, which describes a circus as somewhere where animals are kept for the purposes of performing tricks. We didn't want that sort of narrow definition because circuses have moved on since then. Quite often, animals are used maybe for display purposes and aren't actually performing a trick. Um, the ordinary, if, if we don't define it in the bill, it will take the ordinary meaning. And quite often, the Oxford English Dictionary is actually cited and relied on by courts in terms of defining what something is if it's left to ordinary interpretation. Now, the Oxford English Dictionary says that um, a circus is a circular arena surrounded by tiers of seats for the exhibition of equestrian, acrobatic and other performance, and also the company or troupe of performers and their equipage. So basically, it is the place of the circus and the acts that are in the circus. But the proposed ban will not apply to a static circus. So we have, we have uh, within my constituency, I have a, a theme park who technically could have a static circus that could be there all year round, and this legislation would not cover that theme park. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Um, the justification is that the travelling environment was one of the key parts of the ethical objections, which applies to travelling circuses but doesn't apply to other circumstances. So there are other circumstances, as you said, theme parks and other situations in which animals are used for performance. But if they're permanently based there, the, the reasoning is that they, there's more possibility for them to be provided with a, a suitable, stable environment um, which provides more enrichment, allows them to express more natural behaviours when they're not performing. So that's really why we've focused on travelling. If you allow me to develop this uh, convener, um, this successful theme park in my area brings in reindeer for Christmas shows, etc. Uh, so they, the reindeer are travelling to the theme park. And there also are reindeer throughout the, the land that uh, are brought to... I remember I was at a show in Aboyne, a uh, Christmas show in Aboyne, which was excellent. Uh, reindeer were there. You know, are these animals going to be covered under this Act or not? Well, we wouldn't regard those displays as a, a travelling circus. Um... OK, uh, and my, my, my other question... Um, you go to garden centres throughout the land and there are people standing there with uh, birds of prey and, and owls and 
you know, and everyone's uh -huh. uh, they're raising money for charity and kids are, are, are learning about, about uh, you know, the, the how to treat birds, etc. Uh -huh. um, would they be covered under this Act? Well, again, they wouldn't be commonly understood to be a travelling circus, so they would not be covered. Um, so these are the sort of situations that we would propose to address in future with updated uh, licensing question. or registration. Sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry Andrew. No, uh, my last question is that, um, in this theme, um, if the Scottish Government have chosen, uh, had chosen to limit the scope of the bill to travel and circuses, why have you chosen to do that rather than cover, you know, people have concerns about uh, the treatment of animals. I'm a dog lover. I, I don't like dogs being mistreated and, uh, you know, so at the end of the day, and, and any other animal, I wouldn't like to be mistreated. Um, so why have we chosen only to um, select on circuses? Well, I think the the issue of travelling circuses is one that has been a subject of particular public concern for many years. And obviously it was a manifesto commitment of the SNP to specifically ban wild animals in, in circuses. Um, it's also something that's been something that the UK government wants to take forward. But as I've tried to explain, the, the key argument is that the particular ethical objections to travelling circuses all inevitably apply to travelling circuses, but they don't apply to the same extent to other uses of animals. So we think it's appropriate. There is, we feel, a sufficient you know, public opprobrium and moral objection specifically to travelling circuses to ban the use of wild animals in those environments. But for all these other possible uses of wild or domestic animals, we don't think there's sufficient you know, public opprobrium to ban them completely but we would like to improve the arrangements for registration and introduce licensing conditions which are appropriate to the particular uses. Thank you, Kidian. OK, thank you, Mr. Can I e explore another aspect of this? Because obviously this purpose is about clearing up any ambiguity, both in the minds of the MSPs, but also that where a bill may not be clear enough. I I've read this a few times, and I'm not 100% sure on the issue of wintering, overwintering of animals and, and whether or not this is covered. So we have had a case in Scotland, at least one case, where there was concern expressed about circus animals being wintered and being displayed. So I'd just like some clarity for the record on whether wild animals being wintered in Scotland, that will still be permissible or will it only be permissible if they're not displayed and or a charge levied? Yeah. Um, well, the bill specifically concerns the use of wild animals and describes the use as the performance, display or exhibition. Um, whether that's for a public charge or not is irrelevant. So any performance, display or use of wild animals in travelling circuses is prohibited. The scope of the travelling circuses covers any premises connected with travelling circuses. So that would cover overwintering premises that in Scotland that animals associated with the travelling circus might be brought to. So any performance, public display or exhibition of those animals at that overwintering site would be prohibited by the bill. What the bill isn't going to do is prohibit the private keeping of wild animals, mm. which may or may not have been associated with the circus at some point in the past. So it won't prohibit circuses from transporting animals through Scotland or keeping them privately in Scotland if there's no public display of those animals. Okay, okay. thank you. That's useful to get that on the record. Claudia Beamish. Right. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, just to push that one a bit further um, on, on that last point that you made, uh, it's hard to fathom why um, uh, the reasons why the bill doesn't prevent animals being kept or transported by circuses while in Scotland, so long as they are not going to perform or be displayed or exhibited in Scotland, because I understand that it might be difficult in terms of a bill, but it would seem that that should be part of um, what, what happens. Yeah. Um, well, as I explained, one of the key ethical objections was that it's the viewing of the use of these animals performing unnatural behaviours that is 
potentially harmful to younger people and engenders uh, attitudes that are considered to be disrespectful to wild animals. So it's the actual viewing of these animals is felt to be particularly morally objectionable. Um, the other difficulties that we would have are that if we prohibited or sought to prohibit the private keeping of wild animals that had been associated with the travelling circus, there would be inconsistencies in that private individuals are allowed to keep wild animals if they comply with appropriate legislation. Wild animals can also be kept in other environments by zoos and safari parks and other enterprises. So if we sought to prevent circuses from keeping wild animals, that could be perceived as discriminatory and would affect people's right to own property, basically, which would contravene the European Convention on Human Rights um, on, a, on a couple of counts. We'd also then potentially have a, a problem of what you actually did with the, the wild animals if there was a general prohibition across the UK from people who were associated with travelling circuses from keeping wild animals, there would be the practical problem of what you actually do with the existing wild animals in circuses. And no doubt there'd be stories of animals having to be put down or being rehomed or being separated from the people who regarded them as um, companions and almost family members in some cases. So there would be a, this sort of welfare difficulty of what you actually practically did with the wild animals which were no longer allowed to be kept by um, people associated with the circuses. Okay, thank you. Um, can I just raise a question of the definition of wild animal? Because there is an argument that, given the potential changes to behaviour, life cycle of uh, physiology of some wild animals that could occur <coughs> when they are closely engaged with human beings or practices over a period of time, is there any concern that the definition of wild animals, as we would understand it, could be challenged? Um, well, the definition that we've used as being animals that are other than animals that are commonly domesticated in the British Isles, um, we have a similar um, status for wild animals under the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act 2006. And that, I think, has allowed some useful flexibility in interpretation. I think it has been sort of widely understood and accepted. Um, there are problems in that wild can be defined in different ways for different pieces of legislation and in different contexts. So in some cases, wild could be associated with danger um, or it could be associated with animals that have been free living and aren't captive. But for our particular purposes under this bill, it's we have used a definition that is closely related to wording under the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act. We feel that that you know, provides you know, sufficient explanation, but does allow some flexibility for changes in circumstances. OK, thank you. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Kavina. Um, could, could I ask you both um, what other approaches um, to addressing the issues associated with the use of wild animals in travelling circuses did the Scottish Government consider and why did they rule these out in favour of the legislative approach? Um, well, the, as I've tried to outline, the public demand has really been for complete prohibition of wild animals in travelling circuses. You'll be aware, of course, that in England a licensing regime was introduced. Mm -hmm. um, now, we decided not to introduce a similar regime in Scotland, partly because we didn't have any wild animals in travelling circuses in Scotland at the time. Um, but we didn't feel that a licensing regime would really address the key ethical issues that I've outlined, which we think justify a complete ban on that particular use of wild animals in travelling circuses. Um, uh, we don't think licensing would address that. That's helpful, thank you. We're going to move on to a different theme, but before we do, just to get some context here, could you outline for us the scale of uh, travelling circuses as it, as it pertains to Scotland? Well, we have um, travelling circuses do visit Scotland. Um, I believe we currently have one that has animals, so it has horses, um, dogs and budgerigars, I believe, and I think last year they had performing domestic cats. 
and there are human-only circuses that visit from time to time. We haven't had any circuses with wild animals visit Scotland for several years now. Um, in England, there are two currently licensed circuses with wild animals. They have their own particular rounds in Wales and the, the Midlands of England, and they've given no indication that they want to come to Scotland um, in the near future. So, effectively, we haven't had any wild animals in travelling circuses in Scotland for several years. OK. Uh, and apologies if we've touched on this, but I want to just get this clear. Mm -hmm. If you had a travelling circus with animals based in England, and it was heading for Northern Ireland, mm -hmm. and it travelled through the port of Stranraer, mm -hmm. would that in any way be covered? Um, well, as I've said, we haven't banned the private keeping of animals, of wild animals and travelling circuses. So, provided those wild animals weren't used for performance, display or exhibition while they're in Scotland, then no offence will be committed by transporting them through Scotland. OK, I just want to get that absolutely clear on the record. Angus MacDonald. OK, thanks, uh, convener. If I could turn to the, the issue of enforcement. Um, we know that Schedule 1 makes provision for local authorities um, or Scottish ministers to appoint an inspector uh, for the purpose of enforcing the legislation. Um, could you tell us what discussions uh, have the Scottish Government had with local authorities, uh, the SSPCA and Police Scotland on the enforcement approach uh, and the provisions? Yeah, we have certainly had discussions with local authorities. Um, we anticipate that local authorities would in practice be the key people who might enforce this legislation, given that it's very unlikely that uh, we think that circuses with wild animals would choose to come to Scotland if they know there's, there's a, a ban in place. But if it did happen, we would expect local authority inspectors to be the first point of contact, as they would also need to apply for public entertainment licences to perform in Scotland. Um, I don't think we have had direct discussions with the police. I might be wrong, but I don't think we have. And the Scottish SPCA, again, we don't think that they would be directly involved, but they are certainly aware, and we have had general discussions with them um, about the bill. OK, so do you plan to have discussions with Police Scotland at some point? Or? Um, it's something, yes, we could contact them and let them know about the bill. OK, so just for the record, you're saying that um, it will be local authority inspectors based uh, in the local authority, but who are they accountable to? Who will they be accountable to? Um, well, local authority inspectors are appointed by the local authorities to, um, as inspectors for a wide range of animal health and welfare legislation. Um, so ultimately, the local authorities appoint the, those inspectors and are okay. accountable for them. OK. Um, if I could turn to uh, the issue of fines, um, Schedule 1 also provides for someone that uh, commits an offence under Section 1 uh, to be liable to a maximum of fine not exceeding Level 5, which I understand is uh, £5,000 at the moment, uh, on the, the, the standard scale. Um, how did the Scottish Government arrive at the proposed maximum fine level, and uh, how does that level compare with the income from uh, a run of uh, circus performances? Thank you. I'll let Andrew deal with that. Um, the £5,000 was... Um, chosen because it is commensurate with other um, offence provisions in other animal legislation, in particular the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act 2006, which um, allows for offences under the part of the Act dealing with animal welfare to be set at level five, £5,000, except in certain instances of extreme cruelty, um, like unnecessary suffering or animal fights. But if there was unnecessary suffering within a circus context, we could actually use the powers in the 2006 Act um, and prosecute under those provisions, and then there is a much higher fine, it's £20,000. So you're fairly confident that between the two uh, yeah. possibilities, that's going to be an appropriate deterrent. Yeah, because we've actually had the 2006 Act in place for some time, and generally it's working well, and so we've been able to use the information from the 2006 Act to feed that into the provisions of our bill, and in particular the enforcement provisions. Okay, and w would you envisage a, a situation where 
you've got multiple individuals within an organisation uh, who could potentially be held responsible um, for, for an offence. Um, would each of them be liable for a fine, or would it just be the, 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 you, the business? If you look at the way the bill is drafted, you'll see that the person who commits the, the offence is the circus operator. And you'll see that we've actually listed more than one type of person who could be the circus operator. Um, so in some instances, depending on the facts and circumstances of an individual case, yes, it is possible that there may be more than one fine on more than one person. But a lot will depend on the actual setup of the circus. But it may well be that the circus owner um, may be different from the person who has overall responsibility or ultimately responsible for the circus in the UK and so it, there may be a possibility of more than one fine. There are also situations where a circus may actually be owned or managed by more than one person and sometimes you might get um, families together managing a circus and in, in these sorts of situations you would look um, to potentially have more than one fine. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you very much, convener. Um, <coughs> Uh, on the economic impact, um, you, you, know, you logically come to the conclusion uh, that given there have been no circuses in Scotland for several years, uh, financial impact uh, would be minimal in practice, which I think is uh, fairly easy to agree with. Uh, just behind the evidence behind uh, some of this, uh, you mentioned earlier that the consultation was published, but as we understood it, the individual responses hadn't been published. Could you just confirm around that? I don't think they're right. I think they're right. Okay, so I just... Sorry, colleagues. Oh, sorry. Yes, the, the individual responses I think are still to be published. So yeah. I thought they had been. So I apologise for that mistake. Just to clarify that. Thank, thank you. Yeah, okay. part, part of the point of the question. So I think we do understand that the responses, the individual responses, are going to be published in future. In the Can process you, of being yeah, published. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. So just in the absence of those, but for the record today, uh, could, could you just talk around whether the Circus Guild of Great Britain? Uh, performing Animals Welfare Standards International uh, and Producers Alliance for Cinema and Television had raised any economic concerns with the Scottish Government about the proposed bill, and if so, what were those? Okay. Well, we actually had a meeting with um, those organisations last week, and they explained that, obviously, as their circuses haven't visited Scotland for several years, they're not particularly concerned about that aspect of it. But they did make the point that if there was a, a wider prohibition of wild animals in travelling circuses, it could have, have had knock-on effects for the uh, film and television industry. And they made the point that some of the wild animals currently used in travelling circuses are also used in film productions and, and TV productions. So particularly animals like the, the big cats that you may have seen in you know, TV or films, many of those will have... Um, a background or they will have been sourced from people who also operate circuses so they may be performing circus animals that are also used in film and TV production. So that was their, their main concern from the economic point of view was that if there was a wider prohibition then that would adversely affect those uses of animals. Thank you very much and is there a time scale for the publication of the individual responses? Oh, Yeah, yeah, I think there were some technical difficulties. I thought they had been published because I, I knew that we had given approval for them to be published, and I thought they were actually in the process of being published, but obviously there are a few technical problems about, I think, to do with the, the volume and the size, you know, the physical size of the data that um, is to be published. Thank you. Back to the committee and outline what you... Once you've looked into it, the, the likely timeframes that you're working to... Yes, means. we'll do that. We'll write and let you know when they're... Are due to be published. Yeah. No. Uh, Mark Roscoe. Yeah, just going back to the definition of a circus again, um, I mean, it's clear that there's now multiple definitions of a circus, and you're, you're introducing a, a further one based on the, the Oxford English Dictionary. It, could that be problematic? Um, um, we don't think so. I mean, there is, I think, a general understanding that. Um, if a word isn't specifically defined for a particular purpose in legislation, then it tends to take its dictionary definition. And I think there is a, a common understanding of what a circus, in particular what a travelling circus entails, that is different from other, other uses. So we don't 
anticipate any particular difficulty in uh, trying to define what a travelling circus is as commonly understood by the general public or the man in the street. But, but it is already defined in law under several different acts. In fact, it's quite specific what the nature of a circus is. So I'm asking about that, that difficulty where you have two pieces of legislation, one which defines a circus in one way and one which, if this bill is passed, would define a circus in a very different way. Is that, does that create challenges? Well, we do find this in other situations where a particular word can be defined in a particular way to suit the particular context and measures in one particular piece of legislation. So, as I've mentioned, wild might be defined in different ways for different pieces of legislation. And a circus might be defined, um, I believe it's defined for the Dangerous Wild Animals Act, but that's in the context of the Dangerous Wild Animals Act. But I don't know if Angela wants to add anything. Um, Circus is defined in the Dangerous Wild Animals Act 1976 and also the Zoo Licensing Act 1981, but for those specific pur purposes, this bill is about wild animals in travelling circuses, which is quite a different purpose from the licensing of zoos, and therefore we do need a different definition of circus in relation to this bill. So in relation to the 1970s Act, where it talks about animals being used um, in a way, in a performance um, setting, uh, to either carry out tricks or manoeuvres, that, that's largely irrelevant to this bill because you're just taking a much broader dictionary definition and saying it doesn't matter where they are, wild animals aren't allowed. Um, basically, if, if it's something that would be commonly understood to be a travelling circus then, or premises associated with a travelling circus, then that is what is covered in our bill. I think right. it's technically... it's. it's we're leaving the definition of circus to ordinary interpretation, but we do actually specifically define what a travelling circus is in terms of its movement from place to place. Um, so I think in, in these situations we, we fall back on we couldn't possibly adopt the definition from other legislation because it just wouldn't work for these purposes because one of the key things is we want to prohibit display. And the definitions in the, the older legislation just didn't take into account that animals were merely going to be used for display. So if, if I mean, hypothesising here, but if you wanted to get around this legislation, you'd have to conduct the circus not in a tent, you'd have to have no other ancillary acts around it, acrobats, I'm reading the Oxford English Dictionary definition here, clowns, other entertainers, you'd have to avoid all of that and then you could get around this legislation, is that right? But then it basically wouldn't be a circus. Okay. But in terms of definition, how often does a circus have to travel to be a travelling circus? Um, it really just has to, has to travel from place to place. If it is a circus and it moves from one place, performs, and then moves to another place and performs, it's a travelling circus. It, it's a movement circus. It doesn't have circus. to travel. I mean, we specifically don't want a situation where people can get out of the legislation yes. by travelling maybe just once a year or, you know, yeah. In, in some way to avoid it. If it travels from place to place, it's a travelling circus. Right, thank you. Richard Lyle. You quoted the uh, Scotland 1982 Civic Government Act, Licensing Act, which came in and um, was passed, uh, which only applies to Scotland, um, and the law is different from a showman's point of view in England. Um, there's been so many different uh, permutations put on by councils onto this Act, and adds on and adds on and adds on. How are you going to ensure that this, and particularly in Mark Ruskell's uh, point, if I decided to, I was a circus owner, but I then changed, I took the circus out and put Wild West Show, or um, you've got, I'm reminded that there were, for several years there was, sta uh, I can't even remember the exact breed of stallions who were going around Vienna, sort of horse show, going round. So would these be affected? I'm concerned that, just to finish off, convener, could horse shows be safari parks, theme parks, vets, zoos be affected by this law? We've got to ask because it is my experience that councils uh, have very different... Per you make the law, but they have a very different perception of the law when it gets out there. Well, as, as we've outlined, the bill is specifically limited to travelling circuses, and these will be things that we commonly understood to be travelling circuses. Anything involving horses, horses are domesticated animals, so they're excluded anyway. Um, I suppose it, there could be circumstances in which a travelling circus chose to call itself something different, 
but then I think people would still have to form a view and saying, does this enterprise or, or show include elements such as acrobats, clowns, variety of acts and performing animals? And if it does, I think that there might then be a common understanding that it was reasonable to call that a travelling circus, even though it didn't describe itself as such. Yeah, but it's the point, just to finish that off, and I'm sorry to keep pressing you, because I have had experience of uh, how things are perceived but don't arrive that way. So if someone has a wild animal uh, and changed it, does it and doesn't, it's not a circus, it's something else, but doesn't have acrobats, etc., etc., is that covered under this law? I can see you shaking your head, Angela. <laughs> so there is, a, there is a way around this. Don't call yourself a circus. Don't have acrobats, but you can still have wild animals, and we can of touch them. Yes or no? Well, as we've described, if it's a single wild animal act which doesn't have the accompanying other acts of a traditional circus nature, then it's effectively, yes, a single wild animal display or act. So, sorry, Katina, I do apologise. Um, penguins, uh, seals, performing seals, mm -hmm. um, zebras, llamas, would you class them as wild animals? Um, well, the, the definition describes wild as animals that are of a kind other than animals that are commonly domesticated in the British Isles. So clearly penguins aren't commonly domesticated in the British Isles, so they would fall under the definition of wild animals for the purposes of this legislation. And I mean, zoos and safari parks clearly will be out with the bill because they wouldn't be regarded as travelling circuses. Uh, you've never watched the penguins walk round at Edinburgh Zoo, I take it? I have, yes. You have? OK. But, but that is not reg regarded right, so as a travelling circus. To finish circus. off, I, I, I do apologise, mm -hmm. pressing you, Andrew, but mm -hmm. to finish off, if someone wants to get round this bill, all they need to do, my contention is, all they need to do is take out circus and take out a few um, uh, uh, acrobats and they, they've got round this bill, you know, as sure as uh, tomorrow follows today. We'd then be left with a single wild animal performance or display type act, and that will in future be covered by the, if it's not already covered, by the requirement to register under the Performing Animals 1925 or the Public Entertainment's licence. It will in future be covered by our proposed registration licensing requirements for all performing animals in circumstances other than so wild. If, it, it, yeah, so if there were any kind of loophole, it would be closed? Yeah. Right, OK. Emma Harper. I agree that uh, it's kind of difficult, but there is one... Um, performance team, display team in the south of Scotland that has owls and raptors, but they call themselves a display team and they pride themselves in education, going into schools and promoting conservation so they would not be considered a circus. Is that correct? Yes, I mean, they would not be considered commonly by the man in the street to be a travelling circus, so they would be out with the scope of this bill. OK. And finally, I think Alexander Burnett... Oh, sorry, Finlay Carson, after that, Alex. Definition of circus, um, and really just to get the, you know, any law drafted is to be as definite and clear as possible. You, know, you, you talk about wanting to, to use the ordinary dictionary definition, but as a solicitor, you must be aware that you know, precedence will always be given to the definitions as laid down by your previous court. Or, or existing legislation. So how, how do you see that, that a dictionary definition is going to um, over, overrule that? In, in this situation, we would make it clear in the guidance exactly um, that w what was intended in terms of um, the definitions involved. And um, because it, it has been used in the Dangerous Wild Animals Act, um, this is not actually a bill about um, the licensing of dangerous wild animals or the licensing of zoos. And so you wouldn't necessarily lift a definition from another um, area of legislation, which was not actually relevant to the piece of legislation that you're, you're dealing with here. So because, even though it has been used, the, de the definition of circus has been used in other contexts, 
um, those contexts are not sufficiently similar such that the definition in the Zoo Licensing Act would then overrule the ordinary dictionary definition in our bill. And, and you don't think this will be the first line of an appeal in the first case ever brought? Um, the, Scot the Scottish Government is of the view that it is better to rely on the dictionary definition um, of the, the ordinary meaning of circus. And we have considered it. <laughs> Lee Carson. My, my question, I suppose, is are you confident that we're not going to get messy legislation here created because of the fluffiness of the definition or the common definition of circus? You know, the first thing that springs to my mind, and it was mentioned already, we, we have travelling llama shows. Are they wild animals? Because they're not commonly, they're not native to, to the UK. Uh, are they commonly domesticated? And it, it would appear that, and the, and the more the conversation goes on, there seems to be more opportunity for misinterpretation or deliberate misinterpretation of potential legislation. Are you confident that the legislation you're going to bring forward will not give rise to claims, as, as, as Alexander Burnett suggested, uh, or my colleague here, um, that it's not just going to be messy and we, we could really do with a legal definition of circus in the legislation? Well, I think we have the experience of England where they have yeah, a similar definition of the animals that are covered and they have two circuses that are licensed. I don't think there have been any difficulties in England and Wales about other you know, potential uses of animals that have caused confusion. So you know, I think in the public mind, I think the general public are quite clear uh, about what a travelling circus is. You know, we're very clear that the two in England haven't visited Scotland for many years. There effectively hasn't been a travelling circus with wild animals in Scotland for several years. So yeah, we're not expecting people to overthink this, if you like, or find cases where they would suggest particular activities are travelling circuses when they're clearly that, you know, a reasonable understanding of the term would be that they're not actually travelling circuses. But just in the back, we're not necessarily... We can't expect everybody to be reasonable. And there are some very uh, determined animal rights people out there, and they may seek to find loopholes to stop travelling llama shows, which could be described as circuses. That's, that's my, where I'm coming from. We're not talking necessarily of people who are reasonable or take a balanced view. We're looking at people who may wish to push the law to extreme, and that's maybe animal rights activists who, who want to see all animal shows uh, banned. I think if they took a case to court, though, the judgment would be based on what a reasonable interpretation of what a travelling circus was. So that would be the, you know, the common understanding of the man in the street, um, rather than the, the arguments put forward by uh, certain groups. Uh, I think we've covered the things that we wanted to cover. We may, as a committee, come to the view that there are other questions or follow-up questions we might want to pose. We would do that in writing and we'll contact you in due course. In the meantime, can I thank both of you for the evidence you've given to get us started on this process. Uh, thank you very much. We'll suspend briefly.
Yes. The third item on our agenda in public this morning is to consider petition PE 1615 by Logan Steele on behalf of the Scottish, Scottish Raptor Study Group on state regulated licensing for game bird hunting in Scotland. The committee previously took evidence on the petition on the 18th of April. This morning we have been presented with options for progressing the uh, petition. I refer members to the paper. I invite comments from members on the options in the paper and any other that they might wish to be considered. Who would like to? Kate Forbes. Great, thank you. I would uh, love to take the opportunity just for a few minutes to sketch out my own views um, on this and then talk about the option that I support. Um, I recognise, I think that, uh, well, the first thing to say is to thank Logan Steele for his evidence. I thought that the evidence he gave and his approach was clear, concise and evidence-based and that actually it might um, do all of us well to, to take that approach when coming at this issue because the passions do run high. I think that everybody's clear that raptor crime needs to be resolved and raptor persecution remains a concern. And I would like to appeal to you know, anybody who is tempted to stoop to criminal activity in cases like this because the harm that is being caused is also being done to fellow um, land managers and keepers and others who are in the industry who are not doing anything wrong. And it's them who are most damaged, as it were, and the reputational damage is quite serious. I personally am still not convinced that game bird licensing is the magic answer. Um, we saw in the SNH report, and in particular, a uh, a comment from Birdline International, or BirdLife International rather, that killing raptors um, in European countries where there is a form of game bird licensing, um, raptors persecution is still a widespread phenomenon and such activities continue to occur on a regular basis in most European countries. So it's not the magic answer. There are alternatives, but these alternatives depend on trust and I do think that we need to contribute more resources to the systematic monitoring of bird populations, the levels of persecution and the effective enforcement of the law. And that's probably the most important thing, the effective enforcement on, of the law. What is a key concern is the broken relationships that I see that exist in Scotland in, in this industry. Um, and uh, I would um, welcome the, the approach by various organisations organisations by, such as Scottish Land and Estate who have come together and tried to find alternative um, solutions. Just briefly, I continue to have a concern with reducing the burden of proof and the potential for a burdening law the law-abiding majority. Um, I see there is a bigger issue in all of this to do with land ownership, which has a significant impact on hunting practices. And in conclusion, I, with all these concerns and these thoughts, I would like to see further inquiry by the Scottish Government, which is why I would um, support option two, although I would like to see a line included in any letter from the convener, which goes along the lines of the committee um, not being unanimous in supporting game bird licensing, but would like more information and would like the Scottish Government to consider it. But I say all that with having commended Logan Steele for his evidence, recognising it is a serious problem, but also honing in on what I think is an even bigger problem, and that is a lack of trust, and that is what the main hurdle is in solving this problem. Thank you. Anyone else? Alexander Bonnet. Uh, thank you, convener. I just note my register of interests around countryside management. Um, I'd like to make a number of points which lead me to my position. Um, game bird licensing is being proposed to combat wildlife crime. And there is already considerable legislation covering wildlife crime. The issue has always been around enforcement. The evidence demonstrates the legislation is producing a downward trend in wildlife crime. And it is well documented that the declining but residual wildlife crime problem rests with a handful of upland grouse moors. Game bird licensing would apply to the whole of Scotland and also cover pheasant, partridge and duck shoots for which there have been no suggestion of wildlife crime. The cost of a licensing system is proposed to be borne by the shoots, thereby 
further threatening what is a valued but highly marginal sector. This financial detriment is already being increased with the reintroduction of sporting rates. Further legislative regulation, which will improve wildlife prosecutions, namely land registration, is underway, which should further reduce wildlife crime. The licensing system being proposed is used in Europe, where they have different issues, and it has had no effect on wildlife crime. So I would conclude that the proposed licensing system is inappropriate, disproportional, and unworkable for the issue of wildlife crime that it seeks to address. But whilst I am in favour of dismissing the petition, uh, I was pleased to see the positive option put forward by Scottish Land and Estates, the British Association for Shooting and Conservation, the Scottish Gamekeepers Association and the Scottish Moorland Group, uh, and in the interest of achieving cross-party consensus would support their proposals being progressed. Thank you. So that's an alternative proposal to options one and two? Yes. Right. Uh, just to be clear, you, you, the position would be that we would recommend those proposals to the Cabinet Secretary and close the petition. Right, for the record, that's fine. Uh, Claudia Beam. <coughs> Thank you, convener. And uh, I would also like to recognise the um, commitment um, of uh, Logan Steele in uh, taking uh, for this petition. And um, I just note um, from his evidence, uh, his, his comment when he gave evidence to our committee that um, there was 40 years of, of work um, to try to resolve some of these very intractable issues in relation to wildlife crime. Um, I'm supportive of option two, um, and uh, particularly of the possibility of consideration of, and I quote from that option, which can be seen um, in the public record, I believe, convener, the official report, um, the flexible and non-onerous um, uh, possibility of licensing. And it may well be that it's o only um, if anything goes forward, there is the possibility of it being f only for intensive driven grass moors or across all. And I do listen to the points made um, by, um, uh, by uh, others about that this shouldn't be too onerous. Um, however, there could be clear criteria, in my view, which would have to be met, uh, possibly uh, sustainability, biodiversity, um, uh, the possibility of looking at mule and burn as well. As well. Um, I think the lower burden of proof for civil law is a very important aspect because of the remote areas where wildlife crimes um, often take place um, and the difficulty of corroboration in, in this instance, as we've seen much evidence of in the previous uh, RACI committee and as a member for South Scotland, I'm keenly aware of this as well. I do acknowledge the um, risk of vexatious um, uh, troublemakers who, who might wish to pin something on someone, but this is the case with all crime, and I think it is something one needs to be keenly aware of, but it's not a reason uh, for me not wanting to go forward to support licensing in Scotland. Um, one of the points raised um, in option two is the possibility that um, it could be trialled somewhere, and I would be supportive of that as well. So, in conclusion, I'm keen that the Cabinet Secretary looks at, um, and the Scottish Government explore um, with stakeholders the need for benefit of such a licensing uh, system, and I'm, I'm keen that we keep the petition open. Thank you, okay. convener. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, Mark Roscoe. Thanks, Convener, and I'd also like to thank Logan Steele for the very measured way in which he's uh, presented this petition and the evidence before us. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, it's added light rather than heat to this issue. Um, I do, though, uh, believe that the voluntary approach has failed in Scotland, and I think the, uh, the views of the shooting industry that we should just further embed the voluntary approach um, is the wrong way forward if we're to really seriously tackle this issue. So I wouldn't back... Uh, the option that's being put forward by uh, Alexander Burnett. Um, I think it's quite clear that although the body count of raptors is down, we still have uh, a, a problem with wildlife crime, particularly around driven grass small uh, estates. And I think the ecological data, the population data uh, around these areas suggests that we should have far higher, far greater numbers of raptor species and far greater diversity in these areas than we do at the moment. We've also seen, I think, evidence coming forward um, 
strong evidence that, that's out there in the public domain of wildlife crime, and yet, uh, unfortunately, a, a failure of the Crown Office Prosecution Service to, uh, to take those cases further forward. And I think all of this points to the need for a much lower burden of proof so we can actually tackle this issue uh, once and for all. Um, of course, there are good estates out there who are meeting the terms of the law and are carrying out uh, good practice. Um, and I don't think they have anything uh, to be concerned about if a licensing scheme was, was brought in. Yes, there is the concern about uh, vexatious uh, evidence tampering and people with grudges who might try and set up uh, well-meaning well estates. Um, but I don't believe that that concern um, is a widespread one. But I do think it would be important that in the consideration of the development of any licensing scheme that that is taken into account and taken into account seriously. Um, I would have preferred a, perhaps a slightly stronger recommendation than the option two that's on the table, one which had clear timescales uh, for the Scottish Government to act. Um, but I'm prepared to, uh, to back that option as a, as a compromise that really uh, keeps this important issue going and pushes us in a direction of light touch regulation that gets the job done uh, and, and actually restores our, our raptor species in Scotland. Thank you. Uh, Emma Harper. Thank you, Convener. Um, I've just written a couple of notes as well. Um, I'm a new member to this Parliament. I don't have any face-to-face -face experience with shooting processes, grouse moor management or anything like that, apart from the evidence of the committee and what I've read. So. Um, but as part of this committee, I too thank Logan Steele for his diligent um, petition and the work that he has has, do has done bringing the petition forward. I agree with Kate Forbes that raptor crime needs to continue to be addressed. And as a South Scotland member, I'm uh, acutely aware of people that have contacted me to support further engagement and at least doing something about raptor crime. Um, so I think it appears to be a really small number of people that are participating in criminal activity. And I'm sure that the major majority of estate owners and gamekeepers are acting lawfully, and that really needs to be clear. So um, I think obviously something needs to be done further, and I am keen on pursuing option number two, especially when we're looking at intensive grouse management systems and not just... Uh, blanket statement of licensing for everybody. Maybe we need to target that particular areas. Uh, Angus MacDonald. Yeah, <coughs> thanks, Convener. Um, I think the most salient point in option two uh, before us today is that there does not appear to be a significant problem of raptor persecution in relation to walk-up grouse moors. Uh, however, as we've heard, there does appear to be an issue with regard to intensive grouse management. So I think it's imperative that uh, Scott, Scott, the Scottish Government explore uh, with stakeholders the need for or the benefit of uh, such a, a licensing system. So uh, the jury's still out, convener, um, which is why I believe the Scottish Government should do more work on this, uh, including looking at uh, a pilot on a, a trial. Uh, and I believe we should keep uh, the petition open, pending further responses from the Cabinet Secretary. OK, thank you. Uh, um, uh, Richard Lyle. I actually have a confession to make. My son stays in uh, Mr Burnett's constituency, and having had the experience of being up there, and knowing how much shooting is part and parcel of uh, the Scottish way of life, and, and uh, businesses depend on that, I have to say that uh, on this occasion I have to support Mr Burnett and his uh, 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 submission. And I'm looking at the Cabinet Secretary's letter, you know, and basically she said, the Scottish Government have made a number of changes in the law in the recent years to tackle illegal raptor killing, including the introduction of vicarious liability for certain offences. The show, then goes on to say, in regards to licensing, the wor worth recalling, we repealed the requirement for individual hunters to purchase an annual license in 2011, and it's not thought to serve any useful, as it was not thought to serve any useful purpose. I think it's unlikely there's any case for any sort of licensing to be introduced. And she further goes on. However, I'd also like to be clear: the required primary legislation to bring into force which well could be could be well difficult and contentious. 
A licensing scheme may be useful addition to a toolbox, but it will still depend on someone gathering the evidence of wrongdoing in order to justify a removal of a licence to operate a business. I abhor birds, uh, raptors being uh, ki illegally killed, and abhor any form of uh, situation where uh, this is happening. But I feel that um, option two is not, not for me, and I support Mr Burnett in his submission. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lott. I'm, I'm looking to see if any other members wish to comment. I'm not seeing any uh, indication of that. Um, for my own part, I think this has been a really challenging issue to come to a conclusion on. I, like others, uh, I thought the evidence given by the petitioner was reasoned and commendably honest, where he acknowledged that he didn't have all the answers. Um, for me, there's no doubt that we have to do more to tackle this issue, simply drawing the Cabinet Secretary's attention to the transcript of the session and closing the petition isn't an option I could support. Equally, though, like others, I have concerns over introducing a regime that covers all game bird shooting, uh, whilst raptor persecution isn't entirely confined to areas where intensively driven grouse practices are to the fore. These are where the majority of the incidents occur, and there are specific hot spots, and I think we need a a targeted approach to this. So I'm supportive of option two, and in particular the suggestion that the government might explore a regime which is targeted at intensively driven grouse moors. We shouldn't, in my view, be tarring every shooting business, every estate, every gamekeeper with the same brush here. What we need to do is marginalise the bad guys. Um, I'd also be supportive of the idea of consultation on what such a licensing regime might encompass. It, it strikes me that Adhering to the Muirburn Code, restricting the use of medicated grit, mountain hair calls are things that could form part of a licensing regime, but that's, that would clearly be for the stakeholder group to take forward if we supported option two and the government chose to take that forward. Um, some of the suggestions that have come forward from Scottish land and estates, amongst others, uh, of changes which could be made, I think, are welcome. They're a welcome contribution to the debate and in keeping with SLE's, in particular, stance on raptor crime. But I'd like, I would hope that these might be considered alongside the proposals contained in option two. But like others, I will support that option uh, because I believe it's the most appropriate recommendation the committee can make. Uh, so if no one else has further comment to make, we'll move to uh, the vote. We have essentially three options on the table. So let me clarify those options make sure that members are content with those. Option one is that we draw the attention of the Cabinet Secretary to the transcript of this meeting and close the petition. Option two is as it is there in front of us. Uh, option three is the one put forward by Mr Burnett, which is to, and I'll allow him to be clear on this. Uh, to, to close the petition. Uh, but to, but to recommend to the Cabinet Secretary to progress discussions uh, in line with the submission uh, from Scottish Land and Estates and others. Okay, thank you. So we'll take those in order and uh, we'll, we'll take a vote on that. And we'll begin, oddly enough, with option one. Uh, are we all agreed? No. no, we're not agreed. So we'll move to a division. Uh, all those in favour of option one raise their hands. All those against option one. Any abstentions? Uh, that means that option one is rejected by 10 votes to zero. We now move to option two. Uh, are we all agreed on option two? No, we're not. Okay, so we move to vote. All those in favour of option two, raise their hands. Okay. All those against? Any abstentions? None. So uh, it was six for option two, four against. Uh, we move to option three. 
all those in favour of option three. Are, are we all agreed, first of all? No, we're not. Uh, all those in favour of option three. Those against? Uh, abstentions. One. Um, the result was uh, f uh, four, four against five. Abstentions, one. So the decision of the committee, uh, by majority, is to support option two. Um, uh, we will therefore write to the Cabinet Secretary. Can I just, for the purposes of clarity from the members, uh, would the members be minded that, regardless of the decision we've reached, we would draw the attention of the Cabinet Secretary to the proposals that have been brought forward, simply noting them? from Scottish Wind and Estates. Would there be any objection to that? Um, Convener, I'd be uncomfortable if we were endorsing them. However, I'm content for them to be noted. To be noted. Are we, are we in agreement that then the letter of the Cabinet said we will note the comments? And are members happy for me to take forward the, the writing of the letter to the Cabinet Secretary along the lines we've agreed? We are agreed. OK, to include that line that... Um, that you know, we are not um, unanimous in our view that Cambridge licensing is the answer, but we would like to... Yes, I think the letter will reflect the, the views that have been expressed by the committee today. OK. Right, thank you for that. Um, at its next meeting, the committee will consider subordinate legislation on tail shortening of working dogs. And as agreed earlier, we will now move into private session. And I ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of the meeting is closed.